Hello and welcome to Tatvadeep, Conversations and Explorations. For our second episode on sociology, we sat down with Professor Johannes Angermüller. From 2009 to 2012, Professor Angermüller taught as a professor of sociology of higher education at Mainz University, Germany. In 2012, he was appointed research professor of discourse at the Center for Applied Linguistics at Warwick, UK. He has been professor of discourse, languages and applied linguistics at Open University, Milton Keynes, UK since 2019. His research interests center on the social effects of language in use, notably the discursive construction of social order. He has also studied academic, educational as well as political discourse. Courses. We talked about the essence of the discipline of sociology, the folly to think of mankind as the foundation of everything, meaning of value, subjective and objective values, how certain aspects of psychology can add to the discipline of sociology, the importance of intuition for a sociologist, and the meaning of discourse. We hope this conversation can help the listeners see the tatva or the true essence of sociology. and its ability to help us understand the meaning and purpose of society and our own role and responsibilities to make it better hello professor angamuva welcome to tatvadeep did. so nice to meet you nice to meet you professor very nice to meet you and um, yeah so i just like to get started i prepared a bunch of questions for you professor so uh we'll take it one by one on this channel um we've spoken to a bunch of physicists and philosophers of physics one among them was professor uh, dean rickles uh, he's a philosopher of physics at uh, the university of sydney and uh, i remember asking him something like this that when physicists are working on something you know and the uh, i know the discipline is very robust and there's a lot of uh, you know it's very rigorous but they also bring in the set of uh, beliefs so does that have an impact on uh, whatever it is that they're working on he said that uh, about this belief uh, the role it plays was more in the realm of sociology of science rather than philosophy of science he also added that uh, sociologists of science are concerned with why scientists study things the study the things they do why they go down a particular route that is the research that they do and why if there is any apparent choice of possible ways of interpreting something why they go down that particular interpretive path now first of all i was really amazed to hear that sociology and physics or i think science in general can go and does go so hand in hand and in in a in, in a fairly significant way and i've shared this example because in your lecture uh, titled um truth after post truth you spoke about your background in science and technology and you somewhere described it uh, which to me sounded very similar to how professor rickles described it you said it is essentially an attempt to uncover the social construction of scientific knowledge so essentially what i'm asking you is what is psychology as a sociology as you see it as you understand it and if i and if how professor rickles described it is is actually uh, what goes on yeah um well i guess sociology studies uh, the way that humans interact and create relationships um and it's about the dynamics that um that take place between people mm-hmm. um people of course are part of the material world we um, we are biological beings uh, we are part of 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 nature and uh, there are lots of things that um that um, that are programmed um i guess our cells um have certain programs um as as natural beings we um we have certain limits there are certain things that um that are more or less determined others um are with, within certain bounds and um and the question the old question i think is um what's the relationship between the natural and the social um dimensions of of life Mm-hmm. and um and my answer would be that um there's something happening between humans which can't be um reduced or um explained by um by by non-social programs um there's um lots of things which are not determined uh, between people people can can do lots of things together against each other 
with each other um, in ways that are not in any way um, biologically programmed. Mm. And, um, and the question is, I think for, for many sociologists, how to account for what happens between people. Now there's a tendency in sociology to, um, to filter out everything which is not social. Um, and so I think there has been an unfortunate tendency, tendency um, to, um, to say that everything is socially constructed. Um, and this can be misleading, I think, in, in, in the sense that um, as long as uh, we talk about things between people, I think it's true that um, this is constructed, it's very open um, to all kinds of new, innovative, creative practices between people. But, um, but of course, there are certain things uh, which are not social, that is, which are not between people. And, and, uh, and those things, um, I guess, it would not be very helpful to say they, they are socially constructed. Um, I'm not saying that they determine what happens between people, but, uh, but I, I think it's important to see that they're embedded, um, they interact um, with natural biological um, realities or, or phenomena, and that we need to understand how this all works together. To do sociology right now, like you're saying, it's we're studying only the interaction between humans, and we tend to cut off from uh, uh, all other interactions that human beings are having. It's, we're not just interacting with each other; we're interacting with things we do not see. We're interacting with things that are, uh, you know, like the environment and so many, uh, you know, natural elements. So, what way is there a middle path where a sociologist can stand and say, "I think this is the best way to approach this uh, this interaction that's happening between people," while not ignoring other things. Is there a middle path to, to, to understanding that? Um, yeah, I think um, um, what we need is some sort of constructivism in sociology that is um, an approach that understands that um, what counts as real is, um, is a product of what people do um, and what happens between them. Um, and a social construction constructivism that um, that doesn't um, that doesn't uh, believe that everything is is created by humans. Mm -hmm. I think that's obviously um, a big mistake because of mm -hmm. course we don't uh, we don't create the world. I mean we, mm -hmm. we do lots of things we, we create certain things, but <clears throat> we are not the origin of everything. Mm -hmm. Of course not. Uh, we are a very, very small part of the universe and um, and of course, uh, many things will just go on without without us. If uh, if someday we, we disappear or, or you dis disappear, I disappear. So um, it would be a very, <clears throat> I think, um, idealistic and um, strange idea to think that um, the whole world or even the whole society is just a product of um, of, of 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 a few people. And so I think one thing is. Um, uh, and, and sociologists are very well aware of it, I think um, almost everybody, that of course um, saying that the world is constructed does not imply that we are free. I think that's a very different um, discourse and a very different debate. We are subject to whatever um, becomes um, something we can't ignore, um, something we are subject to our own um, society uh, that we make. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's also a lot beyond society. And, um, and um, it depends, I think, on the questions that we want to work on, uh, whether the beyond um, is, is important or relevant for us. Um, I guess there are many questions where it's really not, not relevant to, to think about stars, <laughs> uh, to think about um, um, the forest out there. Um, if we want to understand why, for example, um, women um, do lots of work without um, remunerated in the same way um, as, as men, I, I think it would be quite problematic to think it's um, in their bodies. That's, uh, I think, an old uh, classic in sociology. Of course, I mean, um, there are differences between men and women, I would say, um, that they can't control. I can't decide to, um, to become pregnant. 
I might help uh, a woman to become pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is another person. Um, at the same time, um, we have certain ideas and um, ways of of um, seeing other people as women or men and enacting them as women and men. Right. And um, that is something that, um, that of course is very important. So for example, um, whatever happens between people in terms of um, valuing what is important uh, in terms of paying people for, for work or not, uh, in terms of distributing tasks I think that's really something that can be um, explained only sociologically, but um, that doesn't mean that um, there's no biological bodies. And um, I would think um, there are certain limits to what people can decide on uh, what they can change. Um, we can't be three meters tall. Um, I mean, I think that's biologically um, really difficult. I mean, at some point, perhaps we, we will get there. But um, currently, this is something I think our bodies will not allow us to do. Uh, we can't jump um, 10 meters. Mm. Um, that, that's, that's something that um, with our bodies currently will not work. Mm. Um, that doesn't mean that um, we, we can value people who jump very far um, more than people who don't jump that far. But uh, the question of values, of course, is a very social thing. And, um, and we can't um, project from some biological differences um, towards social differences, which, uh, which are about values, about what people perceive as important or real, um, about um, how they deal with other people and how they um, bring certain things about. And, um, and so I think that's, that's a kind of moderate constructivism that I would plead for. Um, I, I don't know whether it's moderate because I would just find it a bit absurd to think that there's nothing but whatever happens in here, right? Um, or between us, because of course there's much more. So uh, this question of values, so generally we, from, from what I have seen, like that we tend to describe values through examples. But if you had to essentially describe what value is without ascribing any gender to it, without describing anything to it, but in itself, what is value? Um, I think I would go for, for an ad hoc definition, which is maybe not very much uh, thought out, but... Um since I have a background a bit in, in linguistics as well, right. I would say values have, um, have, a, have a subjective and an objective dimension. And, and both are social. Uh, the subjective dimension refers to the way that um, we perceive the world from here and now. Um, there are certain um, values that are important, for example, for for me here and now, um, I, I, I live in a polluted city, for example. And for, for that situation in a polluted city, it is very important to go outside and um, I value being in a forest and breathing pure air. Yeah. That's, that's a value that depends on your here and now, um, on your very kind of specific place and your situation. And um, that might change a lot um, if, if you change your position and um, you might think of many other uh, examples where um, values depend on your subject position on your perspective mm. um, for example um, you have of course um, different preferences if if you're old and young um, if you're rich or poor if if um, if you're in India or in, in, in the UK or wherever. And, um, and so um, from those very different backgrounds, um, you will see certain things as important and other things as less important. And, um, and that's, I think, um, where everybody needs to be aware that this is not um, kind of spontaneous. Mm -hmm. It depends on your position in that context. 
-hmm. It depends on your relationships um, in that context with others, on historical, on cultural, whatever kind of um, um, conditions. And um, it explains a lot why pe different people have different perceptions of, of, of certain things and, and uh, other people. Um, and this is not something that is totally up to their kind of um, individual difference, right? This is very much about their specific place in, um, in their specific kind of um, circumstances. Um, and that's, I think, one aspect of um, the question of value. Um, seeing the world from here and now and trying to, um, um, well, understanding that from here and now, there are certain hierarchies, um, um, things that are more or less important uh, that depend on that position here and now. But um, then there's objective uh, values as well, uh, which are also social. And I would say that uh, those objective values, they don't really depend on the situation. Um, they're usually institutionalized. Um, for example, money, I think, is a very classic example for, 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 a, for an objective value um, hierarchy. Um, um, you can compare um, um, rich and poor people, irrespective of their situation through the bank account, um, um, the number of pounds that they have, right? Uh, so you can count and compare. And this is something that you can apply to um, a whole population or even the whole world. And so we have these kind of um, universal that is worldwide or, or, or wide far reaching um, benchmarks that can be applied to, to very different situation. And we, we do that, we, we use those benchmarks to, to compare different heterogeneous things all the time. And, uh, and I guess uh, money is one of the most extreme examples of um, that kind of exchange logic. Um, and um, it has been criticized as being alienating and um, being at, at the root of uh, all kinds of uh, social evils. I'm not sure. I mean, if we still can say that. But, um, but at any rate, I think there's um, a tension between subjective values that, um, that basically testify to your very specific position in the world and objective values, which are very much um, um, institutionalized as... Um, uh, ways of comparing uh, different things across uh, different situations. And, and of course, these, um, these different values uh, can be totally opposite. Um, lots of things that are extremely valuable to me um, here and now um, have no economic value or is nothing that can be exchanged for anything. Um, there's a certain feeling, for example, to be with somebody, which is... Um, very much dependent on a very specific place um, and um, you have a very important um, 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 experience with, uh, with other people in, in, in that place and that, that will perhaps be, be very important for all your life. And at the same time, this is something that is totally impossible to compare and uh, nobody will have ever the idea to compare that. Um, I think there's a there's a kind of similar distinction, but I'm not sure I really subscribe to it by Karl Marx, um, who distinguishes between use value and exchange value. Um, it's a bit of, of a similar thing. Uh, the use value is basically what people um, 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 the value of, of an object as it is um, valuable in that kind of uh, um, for, for that specific individual. And uh, exchange value is something that, um, that depends on markets. And um, I, I think the problem I would have with that distinction is that basically Marx was never interested in, in use value. And um, I mean, he's aware of it. And um, there's no way that capitalist society would work without um, use value. But basically, finally, his theory breaks it down into exchange value. And the exchange value then is objectified through um, the, um, 
uh, labor quantities uh, of labor time. And, um, and I think we can go a bit further and, and really kind of um, account for, for that difference um, uh, with the distinction of subjective and objective value, which I think uh, goes beyond an, an analysis of, of capitalist society. Okay, so I think I'm definitely going to put my ignorance on display here, but let's see. So uh, from what you have said, there are a couple of things that I've picked up. One, you are clearly saying in terms of values, there is a subjective um, angle to value. There is an objective angle of angle to values. Now the subjective one from uh, uh, angle of values, the, the, the first example that you gave us was for instance, the, the here and now, the here and now, right? Which basically boils down to space and time. Space like, okay, you are, you are, this place is polluted. This space is polluted, so I move out. And what you are doing then is the value that you're putting is on your life, immediate, isn't it? Like that also means that if you can go out then, like if you can choose to leave the city and go to a place where there is nature, where there is, you know, the air is better, that means you can afford to do it. One is you have the ability mentally to think that way, that you can turn your life around. That means education has come in, which is institution. So we'll, we'll leave it aside. But, but yeah, there is some kind of a knowledge that you possess that is uh, encouraging you to think in a certain way, then there is another knowledge you possess, which is giving you the courage to take step in that direction. And then you also have the uh, financial ability, say, to say, okay, I'm going to leave my six figure and I'm going to go and live and, you know, live, simplify my life and live, live in a smaller town because I value my life. I'd rather live long, live simple, than be a part of this where uh, I'm constantly battling for my life in the sense that the air is not clean, water is not clean, and that adds to stress and creates more problems for me. So the value here is so immediate. It's right directly on your life, whether we say it that way or not. Yeah, I, I wouldn't refer to, to my life here um, in terms of subjective value. Um, that would be a misunderstanding. I would mm. refer to um, a very basic human practice of referring to the world, um, which can be, for example, if I say, oh, it's beautiful out there, then um, I speak from here now. And uh, from here and now, um, I value something to be beautiful in terms of beauty being high up in, in, in the hierarchy. And, um, and uh, while we might have a common idea of what is a beautiful day, I mean, kind of clear sky in, well, at least in Europe, I don't know what's it like in India, whether a beautiful day would be a, a cloudy sky. Um, and, um, and so if that's the case, uh, you would realize, um, that, uh, such an expression totally depends on who speaks. So, um, um, it's not the beautiful day that defines, um, what is beautiful, but it's the person in, in, in his or her circumstances, um, that can assess something to be higher or, or lower on, on hierarchy. And, um, and that's perhaps a bit more clear if, if um, we, we talk about um, much more controver controversial things. Um, I mean, if we, if we think of racist discourse, um, I mean, if, if that exists, I mean, it's very, um, it's a big word perhaps for, for things which uh, are sometimes um, quite difficult to seize. Um, if we say, oh yeah, um, He's, he's brown, but I like him, you know? I mean, there's a classic kind of problem in speaking about race. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we all understand um, that the problem is not in being brown, but the problem is in, in associating uh, with the skin color with, with a certain moral qual quality. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, of course, totally dependent on the people speaking. Mm -hmm. So we would like to know uh, if, if, if we hear something like that, um, I mean, who, who is the person? And, um, and it would refer to a very specific place from where um, such, such an utterance could be, um, could be produced. And that's, um, that's, in that sense, extremely subjective. So... Um, 
Um, and I wouldn't say it, it depends on, 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 on the life of that person, right? It's not about the biolo biology of that person. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the biology um, is something which is out, outside uh, these, these value questions. And, um, and um, I, I think the definition that I gave is a bit um, unusual in sociology because it depends a lot on, on those linguistic expressions. And, um, and I think those linguistic expressions are very important in sociology to, to consider because um, how, how do we live and uh, relate um, to others and, and, and are part of a society? We do it through language and we produce those utterances. And those utterances, they always refer to speakers. And um, the value part that refer to, to speakers and that depend on, on the person speaking that is, I think, the subjective uh, dimension of value. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps I can find a better example. Um, I mean, I, um, I, I, I just cited Marx. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a social scientist and I cited Marx. So um, I gave Marx um, a certain value. Um, mm -hmm. And this is impossible um, to do without, totally without, uh, the position from where I talk. Mm -hmm. um, from the pos position where I talk in sociology, you can cite Marx. He is um, a person that you can cite in certain contexts um, mm -hmm. without being suspected of non-academic um, issues. So um, if, if you cite Marx um, in the area of um, inequality studies, uh, for example, um, it would make a lot of sense and people understand um, that from that subject position uh, Marx has a certain value. Now you go to economics and you cite Marx, um, that's not going to happen. You can't cite Marx uh, as an economist, I think, nowadays. Um, for the exception of uh, very non-mainstream economists, I mean there's definitely some who, who, who cite Marx, but um, the mainstream economy that um, that I see in lots of Europe and North America uh, would not see Marx as citable. So that I think reminds us of the subjective dimension yeah. because it depends on the different fields. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, there's an objective dimension to citing Marx because of course um, it is a name uh, which is very established. So um, in, the terms, in terms of visibility, um, Marx is, is a name that can be cited by every, anyone, and any, everybody knows Marx by name at least. So um, there's an objective um, hierarchy in a way mm -hmm. between um, those who are visible mm -hmm. um, and those who are not visible, and that does not depend on the people observing, but there's some things that totally depend on who observes um, um, and um, that's, I think, what, what I um, mean by subjective and objective. And, and I think now you see that it doesn't depend on, on your personal life, right? It's both interesting and complicated. That's, that's, where, <laughs> that's what I feel like, you know? And, and it's like examples are such a quagmire, you know, like the quicksand. Because like you said, what is a good day for me might, might you might have a different definition and then we'll end up uh, having a conflict where there need not be any. Right. So like even on this channel, like the whole that's why it's called Tatva and Tatva in, in, in it, it, it's in, uh, not loosely translated, but I think quite appropriately translates to uh, essence. So the the fundamental, the, the, the common ground that we all standing on, but because we've built up these different uh, say uh, interpretations of that common ground, understanding of that common ground, you know, how much I can see of that common ground and then I build on it. So once we start talking from there, I think it, it often, often, if not always, leads to confusion. In your own personal life, if you were comfortable sharing, how do you assign value to things? We've lived a certain number of years, you know, we've seen changes, we have studied things, we've, you know, come into contact with new ideas that our old ideas get challenged all the time and then we there is something that we stand on do you think that firm ground or the ground that we should stand on really is the ground of values um well i think the standard response from sociologists would be very clear from the great majority that um since weber uh, max weber's um foundation of sociology as um 
as as not as a value free um, science, but as a science that doesn't take value as a point of departure. Um, it would be very um, strange to to try to do um, social research um, starting from a common ground of values, because that common ground of values is precisely something that um, um, I guess no longer exists, um, um, not even as, an, as a regulatory ideal in, 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 in our world. Maybe it never existed, but then there were ideas of God and, and um, kind of whatever kind of cosmo, um, cosmogonic um, visions. And, and I think um, uh, such an idea is very difficult to defend, even though, of course, um, there's still lots of um, social scientists who are very um, much committed to certain values and who, who commit to something, and me too, and I have no uh, problem with that. But I think um, values is something that cannot really be taken as a common ground. And that, that makes um, the sociological um, enterprise um, so difficult and interesting because you need to find um, an access to your object, to society, to value questions um, that make sense to, um, to people from whatever value background, um, at least ideally. I mean, this is, uh, there are certain limits with that. And, um, but I think um, that's um, uh, precisely the background of, um, of the article about uh, post-truth uh, that you cited. Um, the problem is if we no longer have um, a common ground of values um, as social scientists, um, does that mean that there's kind of arbitrary diversity of values and everything is equal? And, um, and I would say, no, that's not the case. Um, we can very much um, accept the idea that there's um, lots of different values. Um, people always clash uh, for, for their values and there's not a real kind of um, arbitrage, right? In order to decide on, um, on who's right or wrong because uh, that, that ground is no longer there. Um, at the same time, we can, and that's a very Weberian idea, uh, we can uh, study these, these processes and dynamics of value uh, in ways that do not necessarily depend on on a certain set of values. And that's, I think, where it becomes interesting for sociologists. And um, that doesn't preclude um, taking position vis-a-vis um, -vis values, but that it means making clear um, where the value, um, where the values start and end and uh, what depends on myself and on others and, um, and to, um, to to articulate a basis um, that um, that still works um, despite all, all that um, political, moral, normative difference, and um, um, I, I guess that there's a common misunderstanding to take this position as as a position which is relativistic. Uh, I don't think it is relativistic. It is just um, um, an attempt to to account for 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 the plural, plurality in which we live. And I think for for most people, charting the course of their value system, say a set of principles or some kind of a parameter that they will stick by, and they they choose those because they personally research them to work better for them against the other values that are out there. It does not really happen, right? We're not so conscious. I wasn't, you know? So it's like th there are ideas that you unconsciously just pick up because of the culture you're born in, right? And they, before you know it, you begin to value them and you only come into uh, understanding what you value when, they, when it's challenged by maybe your immediate neighbor, by maybe your nearest town, by maybe this new city that you've moved into, which is bigger than where you come from. So in your own life, uh, is there any process that you have followed, in, if you have followed, uh, in, in chartering your own value system and finding, formulating your own value system, like where you find your, uh, you know, a firm ground to stand on for yourself as a person? So that- Yeah. 
Yeah. So if there are some insights there that 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 people can just say, okay, if I take these tips, I can find my own value system and I can stand by it. And here is why. Yeah. 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 Um, well, as as you could um, maybe take from from my last um, uh, response, I I don't I don't think that there's some universal value yeah. order. Mm -hmm. It is something that. Um, that uh, um, depends on what happens between people again um, values in, in a way is is a product of what people do and i think um, probably um, there's a primacy of um, the practice over the idea so um, people do certain things and um, most of the time they don't really think about what they do they just do it and um, and th certain things work for them um, and i mean I'm referring here to, 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 to things between people, right? Yeah. About social things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about nature. That's indeed a different uh, question. I think it's a very important question, but um, in terms of values, I think we, uh, we talk about what, uh, what happens between people, not only, but um, uh, to, uh, to, to a significant degree. And, um, and so um, um, I, would, uh, I would think that, um, we need to recognize that uh, humans have created uh, values and um, certain values have been institutionalized. So um, um, they have been passed on through generations perhaps. And um, there's also a certain rhetoric of value um, in laws and religion, for example. Um, and, um, but at the same time, I think it's very important to, to really see what people do as they say they accept those values or as they try to account for what they do uh, with these values. And, um, and I guess that values in a way is um, it's a certain rule or a certain principle, certain ideas even uh, to be very kind of uh, open here um, that allow us to, um, to account for certain practices to be higher or lower. And, um, and so um, they, they really need to be understood uh, together with what, what happens between people. And, um, and sometimes uh, values are needed just to rationalize what people do anyway. Um, sometimes people um, 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 are confronted with new situations and, um, and, and, and they use established values or conventions in order to, um, to, to react to the um, challenges of the situation. Um, that's also very important. We can't reinvent everything all the time. So we follow certain, certain models. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, when you refer to my own experience, uh, I think there are lots of um, situations in our lives where we um, can't really um, act in, in a very coherent manner um, and in a morally coherent manner perhaps uh, either because there's always um, a clash of expectations and um, there's a difference of very legitimate um, um, norms and rules and um, and so there's also uh, many situations where we just need to try it out and uh, make sure um, that we understand um, what works and what becomes acceptable for us together with others we're never alone in, in the world we always do this uh, with um, everybody else and um, so i think um, sometimes we have a chance um, to um, to to try out what 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 is good for us and for others and uh, we 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 should take the opportunity and um, and act um, in, in, in ways that are then really um, appropriate uh, to the situation and um, in many cases of course um, what is what is uh, presented as social values or other religious whatever institutional values this is in fact very external values uh, that uh, people may or may not refer to and I think as long as they're not really lived um, by what people know works well um, they're hollow and can't be really seen as um, what really drives um, uh, what they do. 
So I think um, I think that's that's really um, a very fundamental thing for sociology to understand um, not what what is said um, or thought um, is going on, but what people do, um, and then see how this relates to what they say and think is going on. So what you're saying. Uh... It's, it's uh, what it's bringing to my mind. So if we replace the word values with beliefs. So I remember Mr. Jordan Peterson, he, he said exactly this. If you really want to know what a person believes in, see what, how they behave. Because they consciously and consciously are acting out their beliefs. And uh, this is like a good uh, uh, way to understanding someone else. It's also a good way of understanding yourself. Right? Because that's in your life that's where everything is kind of uh, springing out from for, for the lack of better words so and and what i'm understanding from your sociology and you started out talking about it that way that it's all about interaction between person a and person b and person a and person e or f or whatever but uh, there is interaction going on within as well like as a linguist you know about uh, this i language this internal language the uh, internal dialogues monologues whatever you technically call it it goes on all the time so in some sense there is a society within also there is a constitution right that it's it's inside us also and it's functioning in a certain way or it's it's dysfunctioning in a certain way whatever you want to call it but this uh, would you say uh, uh, like uh, commonsensically it would appear to someone like me that if that uh, society within you if your interaction with yourself uh, uh, is 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 good you know that how you communicate with yourself is is clear and you're clear about how you think how you feel to the extent that you are capable of holding that uh, dialogue openly perhaps our interactions with people also improve because some, do you think that and then is is that also a realm of sociology how we interact within or is that then a realm of psychology and that's why the fact that these two should marry as uh, disciplines is of uh, is of such vital and critical importance yeah, yeah, I mean, that's definitely part of sociology and uh, it should be part of sociology. And um, there's, for example, Mead, um, the founder of pragmatism, um, social interactionism, um, who had the idea that in a way, um, as we learn how to be in society, we internalize um, the other. And um, uh, there's um, the idea in, in Mead that there's a generalized other that basically is learned um, and uh, whenever we do something or just be by ourselves, um, we can interact with that other in a way um, mentally. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so in a way, um, of course, um, society is not just uh, restricted to, to something that can be observed between one human being and another human being, uh, even though that's often, I think, um, a misunderstanding and it's reduced to that kind of um, behaviorist kind of model of mm -hmm. um, of um, of uh, one pool um, uh, billiard uh, ball um, um, influencing another one, yeah. but I, I think there's lots of things going on within the pool billiard ball, right? Um, and uh, the stuff between people wouldn't be possible at all uh, without all kinds of um interactions um, that are kind of conscious pre-conscious unconscious um and you mentioned um that uh, it might be important to to become clear about your own kind of um um interactive world right in in in, in your head and uh, and i think that's basically what psychoanalysis does um they um they trigger process of talking Mm -hmm. which is basically a process of talking to yourself right mm -hmm. um and uh, the analyst is there as as somebody but but i mean the main thing is that that um that that you basically um uh, bring your different positions and um um your different roles and um experiences in a way out um and um uh together in ways that um that are more um um healthy um than than in in situations when you don't really um do that um have done that uh, consciously so the idea i think is to change those uh, configurations that um 
that um, that organize the way we we think and also organize the way we interact with others. And um, and I think um, that's that's an important part also of social psychology, which I um, think is a very interesting, very uh, important field uh, where there's lots of overlap between psychology, some some type of psychology and 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 um, and sociology. Um, in your talk, which was uh, titled Truth After Post-Truth. So you also talked about the social mechanism and practices in the construction of wrong knowledge and how this wrong knowledge can get hold of a society. Now, I think my question is very obvious. Like there are two questions here, but the first question is wh what constitutes wrong knowledge? Are there any ways to know how a knowledge can be wrong? Well, I guess there's... Um... Um, there's certain knowledge claims that um, we all kind of um, um, put forward and live by, and uh, there are all kinds of um, knowledge claims that um, that 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 circulate that uh, we follow or, or kind of participate in um, in order to make sense of the world. So we we try to understand what is true all the time. We we. Um, um, we have certain ideas of um, what what is the case, and um, and and these knowledge claims, of course, can be um, well founded or not so well founded. And um, and um, I, in my article, I refer to um, to that debate between um, well, radical constructivists and realists. I mean, the first saying that everything is basically a, a product of of one's mind and the others uh, saying that uh, there's something outside um, discourse and society even. And, um, and, and I just wanted to point out um, that if you say that um, knowledge is constructed or the truthiness of knowledge is, um, is a product of um, constructed, um, of, of construction processes in society, that does not mean at all that uh, fundamentally every knowledge is all the same. Um, it means that some knowledges are much, much better founded than others and, um, and that we need to understand how these um, foundation processes um, work so that the hierarchy of uh, true and false knowledge. And uh, it would be totally absurd to say that everything um, is all the same if in fact uh, there are huge apparatuses um, to produce, um, for example, statistical knowledge about um, unemployment. I mean, you can of course criticize uh, unemployment figures and there's a, there's a certain bias to them, but there's no gain saying that um, um, big agencies uh, producing um, 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 these figures from from questionnaires and um, in, in um, certain procedures uh, which are systematic, um, where where there's certain techniques of of um, of taking those uh, numbers right, that those numbers are much much better founded as the idea. Oh, um, it feels uh, miserable here, mm -hmm. and uh, unemployment must be high. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, and that, I think that's a conflict that we always have, right? I mean, there's lots of things um, about society that we feel and um, they might be true or not, but then there are certain things that are much more systematic. I'm not saying that there's anything true um, in itself or that there's um, um, a certain ab uh, an absolute point of truth reference, right? Um, but I'm just saying that um, some claims um, are much more um, um, systematic and, and more founded and much more, more difficult to challenge than other claims. And we need to recognize that. And um, so in a way, I want to, to say that there's, that the truth is something very social and um, it's not something that refers to some non-social realities. Um, but um, that doesn't mean at all that, that we should be relativists and say, for example, that um, a certain claims that now fly around in public discourse um, um, are just um, okay because people believe them, right? 
Um, I mean, as, as discourse specialists, uh, we are of course are challenged by, by the post-truth discourse of, um, of, of, of certain political actors who, um, um, who have created alternative realities uh, in a way, and they believe in, in, in their lies uh, by claiming that um, uh, there's a biggest um, inauguration demonstration or something like that, which is obviously not the case. And, uh, and this is, uh, of course, something that, um, um, that should remind us that not everything is, um, can be claimed in the same way. Right. And, and, and that when you say founded, you basically mean like uh, uh, verified, statistically sound, and mathematically sound. No, no, no. 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 I don't mean. Um, I, I think there's lots of different ways to... Um, to produce knowledge claims that um, that can be um, better defended than others in, in, in our society. I have no um, uh, preference uh, for, for st statistic over other forms of knowledge. Um, I, um, I would say we should recognize um, that there's uh, certain systems to produce uh, knowledge claims and, and truth in a way. Um, science is one such a system, but there's more um, uh, and um, we should be aware of um, of, of of those backgrounds um, um, a knowledge claim coming out of, of those complex um, configurations um, where there's all kinds of checks and controls is a very different beast from um, the belief um, that the vaccine kills me because uh, somebody somebody told me um, and and uh, I, I think, um, I mean, in, in our populist age, of course, uh, we, we, we always um, have this conflict over uh, science as, as, um, as a true source of knowledge, right? And it has become very contested by many. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's totally uh, normal to contest scientific knowledge because that's how science works. Right, science is um, uh, the constant uh, uh, pursuit of um, of counter arguments and um, critique and, and, and all that. Um, but at the same time, uh, we know that not every um, uh, stuff that people say um, has the same value. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, um, and uh, I, I would definitely de defend the idea that, for example, that people working in in, in a science system where uh, their whole lives um, 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 basically um, in the pursuit of, of um, good, true knowledge. And there's checks and balances and um, all kinds of uh, moral um, reasons for scientists um, not to say things which are um, obviously untrue. Um, claims that come out of that system um, have a different value uh, from claims that come out of a system where um, scandal and provocation is uh, what, what keeps the media machine running. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that one is really better than the others, uh, but I'm saying um, we need to recognize where it comes from. And um, you need to recognize that um, um, it's, it's a tip of, of a huge iceberg of things behind that, um, that, that creates a huge difference in, 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 in truth value. And, um, and, yeah, so um, um, I would be very um, clear that there's no um, procedure as such that can make knowledge true or find out about true knowledge. But um, there are all kinds of social processes um, that create a hierarchy of true and not so true knowledge. So and uh, that of course, all subject to, to social debate and uh, very controversial. But um, it's just absurd, I think, to, to think that everything is equal. So we, we've spoken to mathematicians, we've spoken to physicists, and one thing they all seem to value is intuition, the value of intuition. And uh, we spoke to Mr. Uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss, uh, physicist, and uh, he says that one of the best things that about science is that it's the, the, the scientists can always and should always be uh, uncertain like you should not be afraid to be wrong because that's the one way, that's one of the 
best ways to learn something new. So people who are uh, right at the helm of, uh, uh, of, of, of science, of math, they are saying these things like in terms of that they, they value uh, intuition. Now, what would you say intuition means to a sociologist? Does it have any, <laughs> does a sociologist make room for it? I guess that um, intuition is, um, is not very much well liked by, by sociologists because it sounds so personal. It sounds so like the creative artist, right? And um, having some inner vision and uh, talent. Uh, and that's everything that uh, sociologists normally hate. Mm. But I, uh, um, uh, I, I think that's really not the point here because um, I think um, we talk here, we're talking here about creativity, the conditions for creativity. And um, being creative means, of course, um, doing something which is freaky, um, unconventional, um, which is not really um, there yet. And, um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, people who are creative, I mean, we all are, are creative in, in many ways. Um, we can uh, learn and create from so many situations where something new happens that that is precisely not um, part of uh, common sense or kind of common culture, and um, and so I, I I think there's a great deal of truth in in in, in what the colleague says about um, intuition as a source of um, truth. I mean, um, once you've learned, seen, or kind of done many things, um, it's no longer um, a very perhaps rational thing um, or kind of deliberate um, process, but sometimes you feel where you can push a bit further, and that that's kind of interesting, and um, and you just go go ahead, and you don't know why, and um, and um, and yeah, sometimes this is how how we work as as human beings in in these um, in these contexts. Would you consider it a good value to have? as an individual to actually see it as a value oh yeah i would <laughs> i would definitely say that i i would like to live by that and um i i think um it's very important not to have a tunnel as as a kind of um, vision of the world but uh to be open and um to be positively surprised by the nice things that that happen all the time like being with you here and uh talking about um um, interesting, stimulating things at, um, um, at such a great distance. Likewise, Professor. And it's like, we, we cannot uh, keep biology away because if we talk about evolution and we've spoken to biologists and they, everything that has come about has come about because it, it sustains, let's say, life for the lack of a better word. It's, it sustains us, right? Uh, so if intuition, we are still talking in 2022 about intuition, that this is this is as far into the future as we've got till today, right? And uh, so we're talking about intuition. So it, and I'm speaking to a sociologist about intuition. It definitely you seem to have a different way of looking at the whole discipline itself. You know that uh, there are certain things we should not idly uh, keep away from sociology and not res res have a peephole view of sociology because we end up missing out a lot. Even though it might be e it might ease the study of the subject, but we might end up losing. So over time, it becomes count counterintuitive. So there's biology right there. Like if intuition exists and, uh, and it continues to exist till today, maybe there is value in it. And uh, you know, maybe survival value. So uh, I also want to ask you, if you could help us understand what is discourse analysis. So I went and looked up uh, uh, the etym etymological meaning uh, of the word discourse. And I, I found two ways of looking at it. One was uh, from Middle English, which calls it a process of reasoning. And the other is from Old French, which kind of um, uh, refers it to running to and fro. So one is a process of reasoning, one is running to and fro. Now, could you comment on these meanings and if you can add to what the current meaning of discourse is and how an, uh, an ordinary person uh, uh, who, who might think that they're not involving in any discourse, that it's for the scholars and the philosophers and the experts, but might actually be engaging in discourse without knowing it. And then through your insights can take a, can, can improve their own uh, process of discourse or, or practice of discourse or of analyzing things a little better. 
Well, I'm pretty sure that um, the English, um, uh, Middle English um, um, understanding of this course is a metaphor for, for the very same word from French. Um, so the metaphor of kind of running back and forth in, in your mind, right? Okay, yeah. So that's one reasoning. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I would say nowadays we understand this course as um, uh, meaning making in society and uh, the way that uh, many people um, um, negotiate um, social meanings uh, when, when they use language in, in certain contexts. And um, so um, if you um, are interested in discourse, you're interested in the way that um, through language, certain things become important, valuable, but also real. Um, and uh, we try to understand how um, social things are done through language um, and um, how, how people um, are coordinated um, um, sometimes um, in, in large populations, but sometimes only in, in small groups. Even we here as, um, as a as a duo, uh, we um, we are coordinated uh, through language, right? Uh, there's um, back and forth, and uh, we um, uh, we use all kinds of cues and uh, expressions to organize uh, whatever happens between us, and um, and so I think that's um, that's that's how I would define this course. Hello, Professor Angel Mueller. Thank you once again for joining us on Tatwadi for the second time. Hi, very nice to meet you again too. Yes, very, very nice to meet you again. So I'll just pick up where we left off last time. Uh, you were giving us an understanding of what discourse means. And in the process of your uh, definition, you said something like nowadays we understand discourse as meaning making in society. So that bit, meaning making, um, can you please elaborate on that a bit? What that means? Um, it means that um, things are understood uh, in ways that depend on, on the people um, using them, um, seeing them, perceiving them. It means that um, there's a whole system of of semiotic resources or systems of uh, semiotic resources we can mobilize in order to make sense of, of our world. The idea here is that um, as humans and maybe even as non-humans, we don't live in a world um, whose meaning is, um, is given as such, but we construct it as we, um, as we deal with others, as we deal with problems in the world. And so, um, Meaning means that uh, the world um, is understood by ourselves in certain ways and our understanding of the world makes a big difference in um, how we see what is real in the world. Right. And you said that one of the uh, prominent ways we do this is through language and everybody yeah. speaks uh, a certain language. Um, so... Would you say that uh, there, there is a process involved in this meaning making because there are so many different levels uh, at which this meaning making is happening? Maybe it starts with at, at in your, inside your house, then with your neighbors, then it extends out and out and out and goes, and now it's becoming global as well. So, is there any process? Yep. Yeah, I, that'll be nice to know more about. Uh, to, to know about this process more? Yes, the, the process of this meaning making. Like, is there a process involved at all these different levels? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think fundamentally it refers to the way that um, we, in a way, um, develop an understanding of what's not there for what whatever we perceive so I mean the idea is I mean we have an object or we hear something or whatever mm. um, there's um, there's a symbol in a way mm. and that symbol needs to be completed by what what we construct and um, associate with a symbol um, a signifier or uh, whatever so um, it's very much about an interaction between those who are part of a meaning making world Mm. and uh, whatever they they find in in this world and um there are lots of um of um systems of meaning making i guess um 
language i think is um is is in itself extremely complex and you have so many different um um mechanisms rules uh processes that it would be possible to um list them all here but um but i think that fundamentally language is about uh defining the place that we um, take in our world and uh, language in a way refers to from where we speak and it um, it creates um, a symbolic place from where other elements um, can be um, can be talked about or can be pointed to can be become relevant mm -hmm. and um, and so language is not only um, a medium to convey a certain a certain idea but it's fundamentally um, about um the place that we um that we take in the world through um using language and um, that can be very um uh, simple for example when i say now here i i refer to myself and i give myself some visibility in in our conversation but al also i mean a language refers to all kinds of um, uh, people and in so many different ways. Um, it labels us, it describes us, and it also um, defines our relationship uh, of um, of of we who speak towards um, whatever uh, we find in our world. So um, I think it's very much about um, that relationship between a subject um, and an object or the world. I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I think I'm interested in understanding is now as a uh, sociologist and as a linguist, how do these two disciplines feed into each other and uh, how do you make the most of both? Well, on the one hand, uh, these disciplines are extremely separate um, and there's very little um, exchange, especially from sociology. Mm -hmm. uh, soldiers don't like to take up a lot of things from linguistics. It's a bit different. I mean, I think linguists nowadays are quite interested in many social matters. And so there's quite some influence of sociological theories, problems in linguistics. Um, I guess the problem is that in many countries, uh, linguistics used to be in a different faculty from sociology. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it is part of the letters, uh, philology, uh, faculties in France, for example. And in many cases, this is also the case in, in, in Germany. So um, they're quite far away, institutionally speaking. And um, the careers also are a bit different. Um, sociologists don't usually um, deal with lots of teaching questions. Uh, sociology is not normally not taught in schools. And um, so there's little um, training of teachers involved. It's much more about social research, empirical research, and um, and that's something which is much less important for for linguists, um, who basically I think come from the teaching business, and um, lots of theories that um, define the core of the discipline, um, very much about how to account for language in order to train them. I mean, of course, I mean Saussure and um, and uh, Chomsky are not about training people. But it's about understanding language so that at some point certain things can be explained um, to to students, mm -hmm. and um, and so I think the character of the discipline is um, quite different. However, on the other hand, there's quite some overlap um, with a certain uh, type of linguistics, especially in the U.S. and to some degree also in the U.K., where linguistics has been part of social sciences faculties in some cases. Um, in the U.S., linguistics was uh, founded by Franz Boas, who was um, who was an anthropologist, and there's a long tradition of um, social sciences type of linguistics in in the U.S., which is very important in Europe, like um, social linguistics and um, a certain type of conversation analysis and ling uh, discourse analysis, um, and and this is I think where um, both disciplines uh, present quite some overlap. But still, it's quite rare for people to um, to switch between disciplines. I, I think I'm uh, one of the very rare examples of um, somebody coming from um, from one discipline and going to another one. Right. Okay. And uh, I think for the last question that I have for you 
is something that we've been asking all the experts who've come on the show, like um, the discipline that they've chosen to follow, study, research, and even teach, what, in what way has that influenced their own personal worldviews and uh, maybe improve the quality of their life and, you know? I guess it's very difficult for me to separate my world for you mm -hmm. from my, my work. <laughs> I, um, I can say that perhaps I sell my worldview as kind of theoretically, empirically reflected um, idea of the world. Or on the other hand, um, sociological ideas have really shaped the way that I see the world. Um, I think especially in terms of, I think that was the beginning of our um, conversation about um, the way uh, we follow rules and values. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that um, the social world is very different from the natural world in that you will find very few programs or, I mean, strict codes that organize human behavior. Mm -hmm. You will find lots of creativity um, human practices are quite productive. Um, people, um, they not only apply rules, but they also, also reflect on them and they change them. Um, they understand uh, when something doesn't work, uh, things have to change. And I think that's this kind of reflexivity, which, um, which is uh, rather unique. Um, stars don't understand the world. Um, um, oceans don't, uh, uh, don't, don't reflect on the world. But, but humans do, and that's a big difference. And I think that's um, that's probably the case um, that has been the case for a long time uh, for humans to to shape the world according to the reflective insights into mm -hmm. how, how things work and how th they want to 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 uh, to make things work. That doesn't mean at all that people can control what they do. Mm -hmm. They're all, of course, uh, products of their forces, of their constraints. Um, they... Um, they definitely are not free in, in, in a radical sense that they can reshape everything um, from scratch every day. Um, they're definitely um, the trained, the cultural products of, um, of their environments. Uh, and they also apply so many schemes, conventions and, uh, and norms because um, that's just um, the simplest way. But at the same time, we don't have to take everything for granted and we do um, sometimes change. And sometimes we also do, 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 do that collectively. Um, in, in many cases, of course, uh, it's very different, uh, difficult for, for people to, uh, um, to change the world uh, for the better. But I think um, um, sometimes we can. And I, I think that I studied, uh, I have studied sociology uh, also with that in mind to, um, to reflect on the world and to um, to change it for the better with others. Oh, that's really good to know, Professor. I think uh, that is about all the questions I had uh, prepared. And thank you for coming over for the second time. I know it was really short, but uh, from the, uh, I was going through the first uh, the, the first part of the conversation, and there's some really interesting points that we have covered. And I hope. Uh, that uh, people who watch this, who listen to this, may also derive some uh, practical utility from uh, whatever you have shared with us. So thank you for your time, your generosity, and uh, we wish you all the best with this wonderful goal that you have in mind. You're very much uh, welcome, and it's um, great to see um, you're doing this. I think this is um, um, something that, um, that makes a, a very good difference. Um, it's uh, very difficult um, not to to be enclosed in one's little bubble, and um, um, if 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 you can help us, um, well, make connections and um, and um, and yeah, discover more of our world, which is finally uh, in many times quite academic. Uh, then this is very very good and important. Thank you very much. My conversation with Professor Rangamira reinforced how unique the human experience is, that while we are biological beings, we can somehow create and develop ideas and attitudes that might not always have a clear biological explanation. But that, that doesn't mean that human behavior, our ability to connect and form relationships, can entirely be explained by social factors either. That perhaps a point of view, which is wide enough, to integrate the natural, the social, and the psychological as they come together to build us could give us a better understanding of who we are and what our world is about. It will be wonderful to know your thoughts on the conversation and if it inspired your worldview in any way. 
Thanks for being here. And I will see you soon with another interesting mind, demystifying another interesting subject. Until then, take care.